want to turn on the recording? We are recording now. Sounded okay. like Aurora uh, signals traveling through uh, Aurora. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. In, in honor of that, uh, we have to do uh, this. I'm going to do the uh, <laughs> the welcome. So, welcome to the D November tenth. Uh, 2020 session of Tangerine SDR in Hamsai uh, Personal Space Weather Station Working Group. My name is Dave, KV0S, and this week uh, I thought I would get a lot of programming done, but I had a frustrating week uh, stuck on one little point that's code that I wrote, but I can't remember exactly what I need to do. Oh, well, I know what I need to do. It's just I can't make it work until I get my head clear. So um, and, and then little things like teaching classes got in the way and <laughs> other stuff. So uh, that's about it. Oh, I did put some of Bill's stuff up, at least in the um, the uh, documents section. I have not made web page links for them yet. But, and and Bill, is it possible to get those without the uh, track comments on them? Uh, you're talking about PDF files? Yes. Let me go to work on that. There's got to be a way to do that. I, I don't know what it, what it is that triggered that comment baloney to appear on the side there but well you even have some them. that have the sidebar but no comments yeah i i don't i don't know why but i'll anyway, let me so see if i can i think it's a a uh, selection in the print window yes i think so too um anyway that's it for me let's go on to nathaniel uh w2 naf go ahead nathaniel Thank you very much, Dave. Um, things are going fine here. Uh, it has it was a little bit of a struggle this weekend because I lost the internet at my house this weekend, but I have it back now, so that's okay. Um, I have been, I'm working on getting a one of these Edis USRP passive Ina Saunders, Ina Saunders receiver set up at my house here. So I'm working on that. And we've been working with uh, Dev and uh, Steve Serwin on doing some additional analysis of the Doppler shift. So that's coming along too. We yeah. found out that the calculations that Farlaf gives for the Doppler shift does not match what Steve Serwin measures. It doesn't match um, previous observations from the eclipse that I've looked at before either. And then we tried calculating it, the Doppler shift in a different way. We found that didn't match either, but I think we have some ideas of why this might be now. Um, and maybe Dev can explain that a little bit more. But one reason is the IRI does not, which is the model that's being used to the ionosphere, it really did not match reality because we were able to get some actual ionosphere data from Terry Bullitt and compare that with the model and the, the measured the Ionosan measurements were not the same as the model. So we're working on tracking it down. Must be a few missing parameters in the... <laughs> well, it's a, it's a monthly median model. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the, the IRI is an empirical monthly median model. So it's kind of like saying, you know, every day in June in Pennsylvania, it's going to be 80 degrees. Yeah. And at, you know, at noon and things in reality it can vary quite a bit from that so yes very good so uh is that it for you that's it for me okay next on the list is scotty wa2 dfi go ahead scotty thanks dave um uh, yes i think i had about the same kind of week that you had is uh although i didn't have any classes to teach but uh did have uh, just some cleanup stuff to do and uh, still stuck on this uh, filter problem I've got here. So uh, not a lot of progress made this week. 
but uh, standing poised to uh, send out the magnetometers as soon as we get the uh, final list. So that's kind of what what uh, probably what's going to happen next week mostly. So uh, I, yeah, actually, I, when we get to the open discussion, let's talk about that, Scotty. Okay. Okay. And next on the list, we have Dave, KD0EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello. Yeah, I've been working on software uh, mostly lately, um, though I've been doing some har hardware setup too. I want to be sure and have a testing ar arrangement um, available. But um, I've been continuing to work on the command line uh, testing program, uh, um, the C source, but I've also been working on a, a GUI um, written with uh, WX Python and um, uh, been working to set up a cloud-based um, pseudo repo, I guess you'd call it, uh, someplace for testers to push their data um, until, you know, uh, before, until we have a, a real uh, back end built, um, just mostly to be sure that we've got those functions working as we wish them to. Um, it works very much better. Thank you, Nathaniel, when I have the right IP address <laughs> lets me log in, but um, this- Sorry about that. No, no, the cloud thing is really cool. And I had no idea it was so simple to set up and and uh, cheap. Uh, I guess they're trying to suck us in, but um, I set one up for myself and that's, I've done some of the stuff there and trying, there's stuff to understand. Uh, the, what the limitations are and and what the just how you work with it um, but so far I've installed some database software and whatnot uh, so I guess I've been pretty busy um, and I was feeling guilty because I didn't contact you over the weekend about the difficulties logging in but I guess you probably weren't very reachable uh, either so uh, we got that straight anyhow that's wh where that is back to everyone to the the group very good next on the list is bill uh a b4 ej go ahead bill thanks dave uh good evening to the net uh, been pretty busy here the past week uh did a lot of work on documentation uh, much of which Dave has posted on the tangerinesdr.com uh, website, but I, I understand I need to get him some uh, updates to some of those things because there's a great big fat comment section in there, which was inadvertently included because I uh, just selected something wrong when producing it. Um, <clears throat> worked on a lot of uh, documentation for the annual report uh, submitted the annual report to our local uh, PI who was supposed to coordinate that with Nathaniel. Uh, so he has that in hand. Um, I designed the, uh, the database and really it's not a, I mean, it, it's just a tweak of the design that was in the uh, detailed design specification for the central host about a year ago. Uh, but I have uh, updated that and it might be a good idea for us to bring it up and discuss that a little bit tonight during the uh, free text, uh, the free discussion. And also um, working a little bit on um, uh, designing how the Firehose local thing will, will work. Uh, what that is, is that's a mode where uh, you enter the uh, IP address and port of a local high speed server uh, and, they, and the, the data engine becomes aware of that. And then when you, you know, you assign a, a, a given channel that you have defined with its um, speeds and feeds. And then when you activate that channel for data collection, it starts sending the data via the UDP of, of the IP and port you have given it. So I can test that here with a virtual machine that I'll have running a CentOS or some other flavor of Linux to receive the data. So. Um, I've also started uh, adding a, in a few places a, a tool tip 
uh, so that some things that might not be clear what they are will be self-defining uh, throughout the uh, Tangerine SDR uh, interface, the user interface. So uh, that's, that's all we have to report. Back to Ned. Very nice, Bill. Uh, next on the list is Dan, N4XWE. Go ahead, Dan. A script for uh, Tangerine SDR last week, and I got it up and running with a couple of little issues, both of which revolve around the uh, Python package installer, the infamous PIP, or in this case, PIP3. <clears throat> Um, one of the issues is PIP uses the uh, Ubuntu keychain and uh, it stops the script about halfway through and asks for a password for the keychain. So in a new installation, if you haven't already installed and issued a password, um, it asks for one, and if you put a password in, it asks for one when it goes, gets to the point of the script the second time you install. So online uh, research about that, and um, it's a, well, the maintainers say it's a security feature, but it's really a pain in the butt feature. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll try to get around that. There may be a way to overcome it. I'm not sure. The other issue is the compile takes about 25 minutes to do, mostly because of the pip installation. It just goes on and on and on. It's about two thirds of the compile time is compiling a small group of pip packages. Um, anyway, I think I can get around that what happens is that the pseudo times out. So you'll get down to the end and where you have to do another little pseudo make install and uh, the script times out and you have to put the uh, password for pseudo in again, which is really not acceptable for a script like this. So I had the same problem in GNU radio. I got around it some way. I don't remember exactly how. There is a file called Etsy uh, sudoers, S-U-D-O-E-R-S, that governs the amount of time that sudo remains persistent. And I think what I did is I changed that time from like 15 minutes to 25 minutes, and that was long enough to make a new radio install. We'll see if we can't do the same thing or something similar for this. It does create a little bit of a security hazard because every time you Lengthen something like that, uh, it gives somebody else an opportunity to get into your system. Anyway, that's about it. As I said, everything seems to work fine with those two exceptions. Back to you, Dave. Uh, fine Dave, business. Real quick question. What package is it you're building? Building a whole bunch of uh, Python packages. Is this part of the flask? Yes, yeah. Yeah, Bill might uh, be a little bit more familiar with it. I mean, I just see it as a bunch of Python packages that have to be built in order to do the compile. Bill may see it as something a little bit different. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's not just Flask, but there's several things that, that require a running of a Python wheel or something like uh, digital RF and, and right. the, uh, the Python flavor of H5. And then I'm using yep. easily a half a dozen, well, probably closer to a dozen packages to make the tangerine, the local host do its thing. Uh, you don't get all of those sophisticated features I have in there without putting a whole bunch of yeah. background code on. So, yeah, so. Yeah, the first time I went through with the script, I thought it had stalled but actually it was just taking a long time. It would come up to the wheel portion of the uh, installation and then it would just kind of sit there and sit there. But there is a small indicator that little, I think it's like a little diagonal thingy that moves every once in a while. 
and I was just about ready to shut everything down and kind of go back and look at what was happening and I saw it move. So I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> it really is still working. <laughs> You're doing this on the Raspberry Pi, I guess. You know, yes, one I thing am. we might look at, into is whether there's any way to uh, tell it to run multiprocessor. Uh, there are some things like some compiles that can be sped up someplace you can specify how many cores you want to run uh, okay. to enable. So that okay. might be something worth looking into. I don't know if it's available for installing a Python wheels, but I know that the compiler will, um, like GCC and stuff like that, will will do that. Okay. So. Well, let's go on to the next person on the list, which is uh, David McGaw in one HAC. Go ahead. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, not much to report on uh, Tangerine SDR directly, but I am looking forward to the discussion on the magnetometer. Um, I um, did have one thing that came up uh, in our research. Um, our graduate student, Claire Trope, is working on an AGU presentation for um, on our AM Doppler um, T, um, TID research. And she has, uh, uh, she's mentioning different methods that are used for measuring such. And we're actually comparing it to TIC GPS data. But I also uh, mentioned to her the uh, reverse beacon network um, research that uh, Nathaniel and I guess Dev are working on. And uh, I'm thinking she might want to at least give honorable mention uh, in her talk um, that that's one of the many ways that we're studying such things. And one last thought, I was dismayed to hear about the further damage to Arecibo. I hope they can get a handle on that quickly. Back to Nat. Okay. Well, next on the list is Dev, KC3PVE. Go ahead, Dev. Hello, good evening, everyone. As Nat Neil uh, said a while ago, we're working on understanding the differences in the Doppler shift calculated by various approaches. Uh, we want to get the model observations, to the model results to match the, observ observ the, the truth data so that we can seek, seek to learn from the model, but that's not happening. So right now we're focusing on how to learn what, what exactly is going on. We're asking if we understand what we think we want to understand. Thank you. Very good. And next on the list is James, KG4DSG. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Um, enjoying the net and learning things new every week. I, I'm keeping a list of things that I need to look up. So <laughs> the, uh, the topic last week on the, uh, the 3D uh, JavaScript was, was fascinating. I'm still digging into it. So with that, back to the net. Very good. And let's see, next is Jonathan, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. Um, I do not have a whole lot to report. I've been very busy with homework as usual, um, but I uh, do have some, some progress uh, thanks to uh, David and Scotty and, and their help. Um, I was able to um, do a little bit more research on the uh, uh, A to D converter from Texas Instruments and the evaluation board. Um, and I, um, I uh, decided that that's probably the um, best way to go, um, just like everyone else did. And so I had Nathaniel order one of the evaluation boards. Um, this is for the ADC 6140. Um, and it's uh, gonna allow me to do um, um, development, not only for the, um, for the uh, Tangerine SDR, 
but there are Linux drivers available uh, for embedded platforms, which use I squared S and I squared C, um, kind of like the Raspberry Pi. Um, so I was planning on making this board dual purpose. Um, so not only can it be used on a Tangerine SDR, um, but it, it can also be plugged into a Raspberry Pi and used as, as a sound card as well. I don't know the details of the driver with, with its, its maximum sampling rate or how any of that works yet, but um, I figured that would be the best way to go. And I was wondering, and I didn't really, really look too deep into this, but I was wondering if it would be possible to make a board that would fit uh, not only on the Tangerine SDR with the M.2 connector, but it would also plug into a Raspberry Pi without much issue. Um, so your, any of your thoughts on that? Um, when the general discussion or the discussion co comes along and welcome to uh, hear them. Uh, other than that, um, I don't have much else to report. Uh, so back to the net. Fine business. And next on the list is Michael uh, AAK. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone on the conference. Back to you, Dave. Fine business. And I think we're down to Tom in 5EG. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let's see. I put together a, um, a, a Maria database on Docker and deployed it on the server and started uh, building the schema for magnetometer readings. I tried to take Bill's um, document, so I uh, built an account table and a node table uh, that line up with what Bill had. I added to the node table an instrument type and an instrument serial number so that we know what kind of instrument took the reading. And then I added a reading table, which is just specific to the magnetometer. And in that, I put timestamp X, Y, Z, total, and uh, sensor temperature uh, per item. So um, there are Python libraries, I think, that can talk to the database on the server and do appends and commits. And so I will try to use that to collect the data. And hopefully there's enough information in this whole thing that when we want to export data somewhere, we'll be able to make heads or tails out of what's in it. If that works well, I'll um, I'll get that I'll get the details of that out and published. That's it. Good. Sounds like progress. So we're open for general discussion. Okay. Well, um, I guess Tom and I are kind of working on doing some of the same things, uh, kind of duplicating effort with different tools. Um, but uh, we did exchange uh, a couple of emails about that. Um, he, he's familiar with the MySQL, MariahDB uh, world, I guess. Um, whereas I was, I'm working in with PGSQ or, or Postgres, and um, possibly partly because of its uh, interfaces with Redis and other other things. Um, and so I want to make sure that we keep everything in sync. There are, I, I built the entire, I believe the entire um, data model as best I could from um, the notes that Bill provided fairly recently. There are a few things down in the lower, uh, there are a few questions that were still in my mind. Um, after I did that, um, but uh, some of it comes down to di with different platforms, different uh, uh, different database quirks. Um, the um, but I I was doing this on the cloud on this uh, Linode uh, setup, 
And I believe from our discussion last week, um, Nathaniel, Bill, um, who else was there? Scotty wasn't there, but uh, um, someone else. Anyhow, uh, we were going. We were initially going to have the magnetometers write log files and then just um, r sync them to the um, uh, to the cloud node. Uh, and let it scoop them up. Um, I don't mind experimenting with a, a, a variety of ways, including direct connects between, you know, um, Oracle and, I mean, not Oracle, not Oracle, um, between uh, Postgres and, um, and, and Mariah uh, DB. Um, the, just like uh, Postgres is less familiar to a lot of people, it's a little more powerful and a little more flexible, I think. Um, but there, a lot of these are, you know, wonderful steampunk technology in a way to me. I, I, I think of them all as being uh, like a big old train engine somewhere um, and that someone has to oil from time to time. But, the, uh, but there are a lot of a lot of odds and ends we can experiment with along the way and and um, s s lots of there especially for python there's um there python is well tooled to deal with either of these uh, packages there's just about anything you could want and um i the the user the the GUI version of this thing I'm I've been trying to write, which is kind of a GUI version of the command line code I already have. Um, uh, there I expect, uh, barring you know extreme aggravation, um, to to do all to to write a whole interface to the magnetometer in Python, which I've meant to do all along, just haven't got to it. Um, so, including so hopefully some some graphical display uh, of the uh, of uh, in, uh, maybe some kind of re real time graphical display, but that's down the road. Um, do want to uh, warn Bill that I have a few questions to ask him uh, um, down in the data model. Um, otherwise. Well, one thing that uh, we we ought to we might want to talk about, and Nathaniel needs to weigh in on this, is how do we want to store the readings that come off the magnetometer? I've always had the impression that the like the direction was to store the data in digital RF format. Um, but it sounds if you're talking about working with a database already at this point, uh, is there some some thinking that we need to store? the magnetometer data in tables, database tables, rather I than would, as files? I would just store them as files. I'd just store them as ASCII files, zipped ASCII files. And I would not, there's no reason to store magnetometer data as digital RF. Okay, well, I mean, there, there was so much, there was so much love about digital RF that I assume that probably you want that. Well, no, well, digital RF is really designed, the love for digital RF is for when we're actually dealing with RF data. Very, you know, high, high speed um, data. But the, the magnetometer data is a very um, small, very low data rate data that goes very well into ASCII files. So there's yeah. just got three yeah. components. You have um, you have the three magnetometer components, the timestamp, and you need, need to know a little bit of like header file information, you know, which station it is and, and things like that. But, you know, by comparison, it's a much, much, much simpler data product than uh, anything that the radio would be putting out. So it, that being the case, I don't see any reason why we need to use a database for anything at this point. If, if, if if we upload everything to uh, Nathaniel's Linode server and follow mm -hmm. John Gibbons' uh, naming convention, we should be, at least for the interim, good to go. Yeah. Well, it, it chunks out a day's worth of magnetometer data 
and into separate files very nicely. And I have done that for four months. So it, it works and it doesn't seem to crash. You know, just, uh, just making a cron job that, that would, um, you know, kick that up to the Linode um, uh, server would probably get the job done with the minimum agony. There's no, not necessarily any reason not to run a um, server instance up there that just keeps track of what's there just out of curiosity. Um, as long as it doesn't cause um, size problems or something, we're not buying big, big chunks of um, cloud storage at this point. Well, the, and the ground magnetometer data is so small. If it's, if you put in ASCII files and use gzip it or bz to it, like it'll be very, very tiny. Sure. Yeah. What is a day's worth of data? Uh, I can't remember. I mean, it's look. probably like a megabyte, right? I keep erasing all of mine, so. Well, let uh, me look. I came across Dave, uh, that Dave sent me a, a, a great big old chunk of it. I have it sitting here in my download area. I was wonder what it is, is and it turned out to be uh, KV0S 2020 Yeah. the log. That's one know, day's worth of data. How big is what one of those files? Uh, not nine meg. Nine meg. <laughs> it, it depends on which options you've got turned on uh, in yeah. the software. Um, right. and, and is we, that is that compressed or uncompressed? That's uncompressed. Yes, and that so that's an ASCII file. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If you bz to that, it's probably going to be like just a few hundred k. Yep. That's about how big uh, seismometer data is uh, per per day for for one triple axis. Uh, so it, it, it's about it's about nine or, or uh, fifteen megabytes. Yeah, I just zipped this one and it came out to one point four meg. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, is everybody familiar with John Gibbons' naming convention? Because it, it we've worked on it quite a bit and he. And it's really nice. If, if if we use this, it puts the metadata regarding the file in the file name using a defined set of things. And so it's it it it, it obviates the complexity of having to fool with a database. I mean, I'm gonna put together a database that has every cross-reference in every kind of way, but let's let's let the students do that. And they got about a year, year and a half to do it. So yeah. Uh, Dave, the naming convention that that uh, Bill sees is specifically the way your code produces the file. Did I adapt, did I make the file names compliant with the, their discussions? I can't. I've lost track. Uh, I was following that discussion a bit, and then. Um, cool. Well, I was We're just thinking along the same track, on the, but I, I would want to be sure that I'm doing it exactly the way you want it. So the way the so simple soft or the um, RM3100 works, it produces a log directory and then it puts these files in that log directory and they have a date. They have my name. I can't remember. It's on they my have, they have and a I node identifier. Yeah, uh, uh, which is mostly the and and then it just stores them and then once you hit midnight, it rolls over to the next file. Yeah, I just want to be sure that I that I make that file name in a way that's consistent with, with what Bill and John are are thinking. Um, I know I was trying to use UTC dates and um, uh, <coughs> I don't know, everything else appropriate. There's some question about whether, let's see. Well, uh, I, I have some code I need to clean up in, in there because I, I had, um, I wanna keep the ability to, to 
upload JSON versus, you know, CSV sort of data. I don't know how uh, people want to um, get that, but uh, the, I have options to show both raw data and data that's cooked in a way that, you know, that, that takes into account the gain on the, on the, Sen the sensor gain that, that's being used. Um, it's, I'm sure it's redundant, um, but I wanna have all the information there that anyone would someday want to have um, and nothing that they don't need. Um, and there's probably some other things. I haven't looked at it in a couple of weeks. Well, I, I'm looking at the file that you sent me, Dave, and I see it's in JSON. Um, oh, yeah, I I have a, but it can be put out in Common Delimited or okay. Space Delimited either. I can put Common it out. Common Delimited I found works best. Okay, bit, and so that's no problem to switch that. What we did when Dave was writing it, um, I was doing a lot of work with JSON files, so I wanted to make sure that worked and Dave did too. And, um, but, you know, kind of, this is like the, a storage format and, and kind of small, but uh, I think what Tom and, and Dave are working at and what your students are working at is when people want to query the data set, looking for particular uh, data collected by multiple people. Right. Yeah. The idea is that uh, every defining characteristic of the data would be handled as metadata, and then we're going to cross-reference all of that. Yeah. Um, there are options in that command line program to show or not show um, uh, the, both the local temperature and the remote temperature. Uh, along with every every magnetometer reading, and I believe that um, Jules is wanting to have a, a variant of it where he can actually string multiple magnetometers on the same chain, um, so that uh, he, we can do comparisons. Um, but that's a that's kind of an esoteric thing. Um, but but, uh, one, but one I, I want to be sure all the information is there that it's everything we need and nothing we do, nothing we don't need. Yeah. I know Jules is very interested in putting two magnetometers in the same temperature environment and comparing them both uh, in terms of two of the tapper made uh, ones and comparing the Witten versus mm -hmm. tapper magnetometers as well to see that they're all consistent well i'll, ma I'll make that as a you know as a separate you know, you know as a, a, a fork on the on the main code base or something yeah. for for him because in once we once we have done that and and answered those questions we won't want to answer them again i hope mm -hmm. um, i could i could i mean depending on the sampler to sampler variance, uh, if it does vary, you might even want to put several devices and average them, but um, I, that shouldn't be necessary. Yeah, I think there's a good chance that that wouldn't serve much purpose because they're going to be the same, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> if they're working right, I mean, that, yeah. they may, that may be a useful experiment right there just to yes. see. Well, how much agreement you do get between them. Mm -hmm. Well, we, that's why we're going to do it. But, you know, it's those little things that we're going to do. But um, uh, we're trying to get around and get them done. But once once we have those answers, it won't be something we want in our in our main data collection. It's just like clocks, though. When you have two, you're never quite sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, well, in this case, we don't care exactly which one's right. Um, uh, we could have any number of them, and uh, it's it's not a question of which one's right. It's how close are they to together? Yeah, but like the the metrology guys get all into this stuff. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> like crazy. Yeah, I was out out in my backyard with my great big long hundred foot measuring tape, seeing if I could figure out how to put the, a magnetometer, uh, like at some precise distance away from my antenna, because uh, I'm going to do some experiments with uh, blasting. Uh, 1500 watts out of the antenna to a variety of different frequencies while watching the magnetometer and see see what we get. And I, I, I thought it would be helpful to have a defined distance so we know how far away from the antenna the magnetometer is. But I don't know whether it makes a difference whether you bury it. Because if you bury it, is it surrounded by the ground? What? You would have a ground effect. But the I don't know, from the discussions I hear from Jules, he is a big fan of it just because it stabilizes the temperatures. Right, yeah. Well, um, just by way of, uh, it was somewhat connected to that uh, discussion, so those discussions. Uh, in case anyone's interested, I, I ordered for myself uh, from a cable company I know to be pretty good. Um, there's a company in St. Louis that makes custom cables. I actually bought a standard off the shelf one that was, uh, that is cat six, 26 gauge, um, a hundred foot, uh, shielded, double shielded, um, cat six with outdoor, um, rated, um, uh, jacketing and by you know buying an off the shelf 100 foot length was was $51 I think and um, that's I suspect about as good a cable I don't know and there may be better ones somewhere but uh, you could you could probably get ones that were 150 or something if if you wanted but uh, show me cable it goes by a whole number of a lot of different names but they um uh and they seem to be the guys that make cables for times microwave and a lot of these other guys but um they'll they'll make really high quality cables they have the machinery and all and 51 dollars is what that costs just as opposed to the 31 for the 100 foot um, Google uh, cable. Well, that's a pretty good price because what I found online, a 100 foot piece of uh, double shielded, it was yeah. $147 for well, this the. Is, uh-huh. Yeah. So this is supposed to be double shielded. So it's what's the name of the company? Show me. It's Show Me Cable, I think. They must be from Missouri. Yes. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, they're over I in Ch- they're in Chesterfield, Missouri. <laughs> they're over there in what used to be called Gumbo Flats, because it's right. the old river bottom over there where it floods. And um, uh, but there uh, there seems to be some sort of conspiracy amongst these cable companies, the domestic ones. To they all work together under various names and if you go to one of them you end up sometimes at the other one's site um but this is i've bought a bunch of stuff and it's all been well made from these guys and we've actually used them for years around here just because they're close so this was cat six or cat five it was cat six and i had a choice of uh without asking for a custom cable, I had a choice of about four different gauges um, of cable. So I don't know, I hope I made the right guess, but I I think it was 26 gauge I picked. Bigger the better. Pardon? The, The bigger gauge, the better. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but some of them they didn't have pre made in 100 foot. That is a good price for that. Yeah, that's just what I found the other day. So if uh, if we're at a at a kind of a lull in the discussion, let me share 
the share screen and show the database layout in case there's anybody who hadn't seen it. And uh, then I'll also show what fields I currently am aware of that need to go into the different tables of this database here. Let's see. Good, good. Okay. I have a printout of. All right. So do you see the database layout? Yes. Yes. All right. So we'll go with third normal form on this where some things that are used over and over again are actually references to other tables. So there'll be user roles, the roles I'm aware of are standard users, uh, administrator, science user, and science super user. Those are what I know of so far for roles. Uh, when you sign up, you get an account that's associated with your email address, and then you add nodes to it. Um, we'll, I'm anticipating using the naming, the numbering convention that uh, Case Western has already started. Uh, this in in my pit in my envisionment is an N followed by six six or seven digits, um, and that their numbers that they've already assigned will fit into that. So each a node is like a station. So if you're going to have an observation station, uh, you could that would be a node, and underneath that you have instruments. Uh, if you have a couple of stations, you'd have a couple of nodes. Bill, um, do you have an example of this when you when you get through this? He incorporated well examples I'll, into the. There is a spreadsheet which I'll come okay. to next. Is that the one you're talking about, Dave? Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll come to that. Uh, and so instruments. Um, a data engine is an instrument. A magnetometer is an instrument. Uh, a uh, a ground seismometer would be an instrument, and and then uh, those will be referred to by instrument type. That's another. That's in a table. So each time we come up with a new instrument type, there'll, there'll be an added uh, entry into the instrument type, and then from the nodes, as and nodes make observations. Uh, each time you do a batch of collect a batch of samples, that'll be deemed an observation. Uh, there'll be a data type and, uh, you know, just a cross reference by band. And the, you don't have to use this. I mean, it, sometimes we'll have op observations across multiple bands. So this is an optional field. So let me bring up and show. Uh, let me st stop sharing for a moment and bring up and show this spreadsheet that might shed a little bit more light by giving some examples here there all right so on the left you've got the tables over here uh, so that's a that's a, an account table within the every field it's a it's a SQL database so every field has an ID it's just a monotonically increasing integer that's that the database system uses to keep up with uh, how many entries there are in the table. So what what can constitutes an account? It's a user ID, which is an uh, email address. The password for that, which uh, typically I'm thinking is probably going to be the same as a token. Uh, the call sign is optional and a role, what kind of a role this this account has. And there's nothing to stop us from allowing people to have multiple accounts. It's just kind of a pain if you want the, the ID to be an email address. Um, so, so that's an account. So within an account, you're going to have one to n nodes. Uh, there'll be a node number, the token for that node. So you, can, I, you have a way of identifying uh, when you get data from an instrument. It identifies itself by the token. Uh, and that acts as a a uh, a, uh, a password for the R sync uh, when you're doing R. The, the, my system, the local host does R syncs internally for things like continuous upload. 
Uh, the grid square, that has to be a valid maidenhead grill. The lat long are calculated from the grid elevation uh, oh, Bill, up to two. Bill, who would assign the token? That would be assigned by the central uh, system automatically when you're assigned it, when you create a node. Okay. And then you have up to two antennas. Um, you have to have at least one antenna defined and the second antenna is optional. Uh, GPSDO, this is a Boolean field, yes or no. Do you have a GPSDO on associated with this node so we can uh, bank on the time uh, stamps being correct? Optional. Uh, in, in case you want to uh, divulge your street address, city, state, postal code, um, and this has to support um, other things besides just U.S. states, because even to begin with, I'm sure we'll have uh, Mexico and uh, can Canada states, and then an optional phone number if, and that's in case you want to divulge that. So within a node, you may have multiple instruments. Um, yeah, that allows the serial number. I, as I understand that most of our devices have serial numbers, uh, but if the serial, if we have a device that doesn't have a serial number, like a home, homebrew seismometer or something like that, and I don't mean a HF seismometer, I mean a seismometer that ma measures ground tremors, it might be a homebrew, might not have a serial number, so you can put none in there, but something has to be entered in there. The instrument type will just be a link to a a uh, instrument type field that'll be maintained by the administrator with which different instrument types can be uh, supported by the system. Uh, and version install date if you want to keep track for your own record keeping purposes when what version of the instrument it is and when was it put into service. A when you table, talk about instrument you're talking about like a data engine or like uh, a sensor. Yes. So Either one of those. Yes. Okay, because I'm just trying to figure out where, because the data engines will have a unique serial number, but like the magnetometers won't necessarily have one. So if, if, the, if, the, if the magnetometers don't have a serial number, for some reason I thought they did. It doesn't matter. You can put none in for the serial numbers. Not we, a, ha we have a UUID that is uh, calculated by the, um, the software that programs the ROM, and it's supposed to be statistically unique. Well, that should do as well as anything you could come up with. I would think. We could do that, except it's 128 bits, so we could we'd have to to hash it down. To, well, you got 30 characters, so yeah, that's what well, I can make it. Look, we can make these. This is just something I threw on the wall to see if it would stick. We can make these fields any length they need to be, um, and I can also put code in the local host to extract the. Well, I guess I can. Is this something you can query on the magnetometer? Oh, uh, you can read it. It's in a ROM. And if there's a way to read it, we can get it and then um, have some something when you add this and you say it's a this device type, it'll query that and then suck it up and put it in the database. I mean, I don't want to make a user key in 128 characters of stuff, uh, but it oh. should be possible to extract it and is, upload so, it. So we can we can actually encode the device type into the ROM. So it'll, it'll, it can read back and say, oh, I'm, I'm a megatometer. It can read back and say, I'm a revision X. But to get a unique serial number, you're going to have to go to the UUID because I can't really do that in the other fields. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm uh, in the co code I wrote so far the, uh, for this model. I, I made long, uh, very long fields whenever in the least bit in doubt. Um, I, I do not like having to go back to uh, yeah. change field <laughs> yeah. sizes. And right. uh, I'm actually going to mail the, um, if I can find it here, um, the, the model I've prepared. Where did I hide it? Any, anyway, go ahead. But absolutely, if anybody takes a look at this and says, well, you don't have enough space for this or that, please tell me. That's the reason I'm divulging this so that everybody can review it and uh, provide feedback. So I then think there's all, a, all the databases ahead. under discussion um, ha have fairly efficient var care and, um, and var binary even uh, field types. So that, that use minimal space unless they're 
you know, don't don't use more space than they need. Well, you know, this these in the grand scheme of things, these tables are not going to be that big. Uh, I mean, like I've I've got six years worth of of spots in one of our tables, and it's it's over five terabytes. So the, this thing is going to be minute in comparison to that. <laughs> sure, sure. So nothing at um, all. So you leave the version numbers two bytes, maybe a major and a minor, and then that's all we need. Uh, I would. Or are you saying make it bigger? Make it big. Yeah, you know, we can make it any There's, size. You can make these make these ASCII fields if you want. Make it easy. Oh, well, that's what I have done. What I have done. Yeah, um, that's fine. I believe in most cases, um, it's only one place where I used a a bit field was for that one logical. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a false economy to, um, to underdefine these, these yeah. fields yeah. and tables that'll never get bigger than a, you know, a few meg. And then, uh, the, uh, you said you had a field for GPSDO, like a one bit field, but you're not really going to put one bit in there, right? You're just going to have a byte that's either a zero or a non zero. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I don't know if SQL even supports well, a bit well, field. But. Currently, Some we're, news. At, we're planning to have two different versions of GPSDO with different uh, uh, accuracies. So I don't know if that's this is the place to mark that or not. This would be a good place to mark what type of GPSDO it is. Um, yeah. So it, it, uh -huh. Maybe you have a field that just has the GPS type. You could, I mean, you could put, you know, uh, L-E-A-M-A-T in there or something, and then you'd know. Well. Yeah. Unless you think this is making it uh, too convoluted. Well, uh, you could say uh, mandatory. You could say none if you don't have one, or yep. or GPSDO type. Uh, I just I just uploaded should have anyway the um, the the create scripts for the tables I built this afternoon, and you can see how. Uh, but yeah. I did. Use you use ASCII, right, Dave, for the most Well, I, I use VARCARE for everything, which is a variable length character field. Okay, but still, it's real. Not for everything. I used it for an awful lot of things. And I did not. It what I, Most of these database servers do not, um, you know, if you, if you define something as VARCARE uh, 128, um, they really uh, reserve 16 uh, you, you know, two bytes or, or four bytes. Um, uh, per character? Per, no, per per um, uh, per field, and and if you use upload data, they will handle up to whatever you've specified, um, or if it's not specified, to some maximum that's determined by the 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 nature of the database itself. But it's always uh, at least. 128 characters or something and okay. with you know some of the microsoft ones and stuff they're really big so to continue they got an instrument type uh table and uh you know we know of you know of the tangerine the grape and a few other things so so far then the observation table uh, this one, there's going to be a data type that links to a data type um, table, a data rate in uh, samples per second, a center frequency in hertz, uh, the, uh, the node, and that's a backlink so you can go either direction, um, an instrument table, or rather an instrument link band link which that's optional because it, it may be multi-band um, this is a size of the observation that's computed based on the data size 
So it'd be possible to say, show me all of the data collections that are bigger than this size or whatever. Uh, then the file name and the path of where do we store these data? Because a lot of times we'll be storing data as files or as, in fact, digital RF, it's actually a structure that you're saving. Uh, so this would be a point a, to point to the top of a, a collection. So, and that is, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, that's, size is like 16 bit, 24 bit, 32 bit, or is it uh, in? No, in like megabytes. Oh, in megabytes, okay. So it's the size of the file then. Yeah, I should clarify that. Yeah, I assume I, they were blob type. I see one thing I would like to clarify on that center frequency. Yeah. I know you're in Hertz. You're using commas. In Europe, commas mean decimal points. So I would just not use them. Don't use any delimiters at all. Well, I mean, the, this is a, an Excel uh, formatting uh, feature. See what I've yeah, got up and here? And Excel will move it back and forth. Uh, but just be aware that European Excel puts in commas for decimal points. Yeah, well. Yeah, you can probably do localization on. on, on yes. Yeah, you'll have the same problem with dates as well. But I think Excel will, will localize it for you. Yeah, well, I mean, the only reason for using Excel here is it's just fun. It's, it's more fun to use Excel for, for <laughs> designing something like this than it is to type it all up in a text file. You know, it's, it's just more convenient to put things in table form. Uh, the, the, what's important is that this is, this is what's important, yes. that we're, we're storing it in a 64-bit integer in Hertz. Now, if somebody wants to make a center frequency as so a fraction of a Hertz, this doesn't support that. Does, is right. there a need to say, okay, uh -huh. I want my center frequency to be 9.999.9 Hertz or, or something like that. I, I don't know if we have to be that precise. I, I don't see why you need to do that. I can't, <laughs> not, I can't not, imagine it. I wish we could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends. Not saving a sweep of uh, multiple frequency. I mean, it's not well, like you're saving a narrow band. Okay. Right? So let's take an example. Hermes, for example, the center frequency is very much millihertz based, even if it reports out in hertz because of finite resolution in the NCO register sizes. They're not exact frequencies and they're off quite a bit. I think when you practically implement the center frequency uh, uh, DDSs in the data engine, you're going to have millihertz numbers. Now you could make this a a uh, double Unreal. precision floating point. Yeah. If we feel like the the thing with the thing with that though is sometimes when you do comp computations with floating point, it will there'll be this decimal point way out there, thirteen characters to the right, and then when you want to do searches based on that, ay ay ay. Uh, so, um, of course, we could have more than one field. I mean, you could, you could have, you could have one that's the center frequency is the closest integer, closest integer, integer hertz, and then you could have a double precision floating point for those in addition, and it's or, a separate you know, field. You no, know, what do you think about a uh, hertz integer and hertz, and then an offset in millihertz or something like that? two separate fields. And that way it'd be much easier to search, especially if you're limited to like three digits of millihertz. That's a way to do it too. Uh, what I was gonna suggest too is when the stream is established and you send the data engine a frequency request, it is really a request. So in the act coming back, we need to have a way to tell it, hey, this is the actual frequency you got. Because you asked for X, but you, like Tom says, you don't necessarily get X. You get close to X, but it's not infinite resolution. And, and the error in some cases is significant when you're trying to measure Doppler shift on WWV, for example. The error is going to be, um, is going to be significant in the data. The error? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not so following. For example, 
if you try to program 10.000 or 10 megahertz, um, you're going to probably get, you know, like 10.05, uh, you know, 10 megahertz, 0 0.05. And that, and that 50 um, millihertz is going to be important in terms of its size compared to the Doppler shift resolution. Well, I thought the whole point of having a GPS DO was to, that would be, we would be accurate on the Well, the, the, frequency, clock. Will, the frequency will be accurate. It just won't be, you won't be able to pick every increment because yeah, so, the, so, so you don't have infinite resolution in the DDS. You, you have finite register sizes. And so you may want 10 exactly megahertz, but it may turn out because of the counters and divisors that the closest integer divisor for the DDS yields 10 000 000 point zero five or something like that. You may not be able to exactly get an integer. Well. It sounds hmm. like two fields. I think it is. It, well, it, it's just a note. We can we can look at that. You know. Will the personal space weather station have actual ground motion seismometers as well as instrument choices? We've talked about that. Uh, we haven't put pen to paper to design a seismometer. I've I mean I've seen plans for seismometers and popular mechanics. I mean, I'm, you can build them. <laughs> they have you, the, you have the plans for the flying car. There's that there too. Yeah. I mean, no, I'm really disappointed. It's the 21st century. It's a fifth <laughs> of the way through the 21st century and I still don't have my flying car or my jetpack. Well, they do have both of those things. You can you can get them in Los Angeles. As in fact, uh, pilots of seven seven 737s have reported seeing them in the air when making a, on final approach into LAX. And needless to say, the tower was quite a so so with some regularity sure. lately. So mm -hmm. we'll be hearing about a man in a jetpack in Phoenix, and we'll go, "Oh, that's Scotty." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it so this is really the center frequency fractional part. And you might as well make it 64 bits so that we can get it down to the nearest. Uh... Would this be double precision or would it also yeah. be integer? I just integer. think integer. It, it well, could be integer. It doesn't really matter, but it could be integer. So Tom, uh, how close to a millihertz do you think we can get for resolution? I don't know. It's all going to depend on how wide the um, DDS registers are and how big the accumulator is um, yeah. as to the, uh, how close you get. Yep, that's right. Okay, so, all right, so I won't uh, monopolize the discussion with this anymore, but I did want to get a review on it before I tell the students, here's what to build. I wanted to ask about file name and path down there, just by the by. Yes. It's simple things. Um, file names are probably going to be uh, pretty fixed if we follow a standard format, but path um, potentially could be um, any path allowed by an operating system um that that we're using uh wouldn't you expect in length i've run oh, into as far as length yeah 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 i've run into uh, i've run into problems with that more they than, can be more than a few times. You know, 150 characters i know they can get huge oh they can yeah I've, yeah windows tends to get a little crazy <laughs> sometimes when you go beyond that but Yeah, well, I will ask our our computer science people for a recommendation on this because we're implementing it on a CentOS 
uh, Linux box. Uh -huh. And it's a big piece of hardware. I mean, we, the nice thing about it's virtual, we're getting a provision from the university server farm so we can have as many cores as much, many cores as we want, as much RAM in the processors we need and as much disk as we need. Great. And they supposedly, they, they say they can dynamically adjust that whenever we tell them we need to change it, so. Have you, not to, not to foment controversy, but have you made any, um, had any thoughts about what uh, database platform this will be implemented? It'll be in MariaDB. It will, okay, okay, I see. If it's okay, I'm gonna head out for tonight. I'm just, I'm- Okay. Um, okay, yeah. 73. But thank you, 73. Uh, Scotty, I think for the magnetometers, I do have a list, but the important thing is to get them out to say like, um, uh, Dave Witten and Hyoman first, because they're going to, Dave is of course writing the software to um, get the data to the temporary server. And they also need to put together a manual or some sort of instructions before it goes to everyone else. Okay, just to show you here. Right. Yeah. They look great. <laughs> now, Scotty. Looks good. Scotty, a question on that point. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. 73. Uh, Scotty, uh, Scotty, on those, the um, you, you turned the Ethernet sideways on it. Um, now, will all of the boards be populated with the 40 pin connector? Yes. Okay, because that's going to make them a lot harder to package out in the at the farther end of um yeah you know, maybe you can see yeah it's going to be difficult um because especially with the ethernet yeah, i was thinking about that after you had mentioned the pipe because you're going to want to put it in the pipe like this right 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 absolutely so now you're going to have to put it in either like that this way or you're going to have to so you're going to need a much bigger diameter pipe or you're going what, to have what's to the longest dimension again i forgot uh, 38 millimeters, so it's about uh, uh two, inch and a half, inch, inch, right, and, a, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. inch and three quarter. I Don't have no, I'm sorry, it's it's 38 millimeters, the narrow width, it's 65 oh. this way. Oh, so ouch, that, really that really hurts, right? That really hurts. That's going to break our thinking altogether. What about uh, a piece of that foam that you stick on the pins? Could that? Well, well, I don't think the pins is the problem. The problem is if the cable comes out this way. Oh, yeah, that's yes. going to be the real, real. You're going to have to bend the cable at a sharp angle if you're going to get it in a narrow pipe, or you're going to have to put it in this way. Or sorry, this way, so the cable can come out. Right. Fr fr frankly, where we were getting to with that was to to solder directly a cable directly to the to the board and have an extended. Length, but it's it is what it is. We were stuck with it now, so yeah. Um, yeah. And... I have a question about that, Dave, Dave Witten. Um, yeah. I I'm I'm missing something here. Uh, how can you make the board go this way? Because I thought the the card had the the, the z axis sticking straight up. Or do you just transpose the axes in software? Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what we've done. Because uh, what I was imagining was, I was imagining a piece of PV, get one of those T-shaped connectors. Uh, it's I see. PVC T and yeah. little short pieces and caps on the end and put the device in there and the cable comes out at a right angle and you're yeah. good to go. Yeah, It's just a lot harder to bury that in a, you know, you know to, to position it and optimize the thing with the with the vertical tube you have one dimension is pretty well constrained it's straight up and down and you, 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 you know a plumb bob will tell you and all you have to do then is manipulate yeah you've got only got two degrees of freedom then to worry about but um how are you but, getting the rg45 you had an end cap right you drill a big hole and then like rtv it or something uh um, that would be a Approach. Well, we were using, we were actually bringing the pipe up high enough that it, um, I don't have one. You had a picture of it at one time, Dave. Yeah, I had things like, you know, where we brought it up from a 
and uh, actually, Jules has some better pictures um, where where it wasn't directly exposed to the weather. He is has been running um, Cat Five a length of Cat Five directly to the board and bringing out a um, uh, a weatherproofed. Um, Cat, you know, oh, so he uses you know, a small pigtail in the pipe. So it's a pigtail, and yeah. Connector, okay. yeah. A care carefully done pigtail. Well, he, um, but there he, was just too much noise on the connection to, you know, communicate those aspects of this thing. And, and if you did that, I think you could find a right angle. You might be able to find a right angle pigtail. In which case, you would be take care of the problem of the of not much space here to the edge of the pipe. Come well, off this way. I, I don't, I don't think know. I never saw. Uh, you know, yes, with USB for sure, but not with. I've never seen anything like that oh, for either. Uh -huh. We'll figure out something. I think if you don't use weatherproof ends on the connectors, I think even in a two-inch pipe, you could still bend this cable. It's probably not not to spec, but then we're not running Ethernet either. So just bend the cable sharply and bring it up the tube. Yeah, yeah, Still, yeah. And put it in the same way vertically. Yeah, but it's it's the size of the tube. For one thing, you know, the, the way we were bearing the tubes was using these little garden augers uh, that only, that two inches is about the biggest pipe they'll drill a hole for. And uh, they only cost, you know, a little bit and you use an electric drill. Without that, you you're going to have to- Put it in the same size pipe and just plug the connector in and you just bend the cable right over and you know a half you have a half an inch of space this dimension here is only about one and a half inches yeah we'll see we'll see the the yeah even the even the 40 pin connector kind of complicates it but um what, what you're using two inch pipe right that's where we are right now that's the last discussions uh jules and i have had about it mm -hmm. um you know, I think we could have some fun with this. We could have, have a design competition. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mechanical engineering problem. I mean, yes. the yes. have been it doing is. this for it is. years. And it wouldn't be hard to 3D print something that would be perfect for it. Yeah, in some way. yeah but that's an idea. I, except I'm, that that's not a solution. I'm, there is a right angle um, RJ45. Oh, you, you did? Go. What do you know? There's even an adapter. You can yeah, plug it with a cable in, but... Cool. I, I hadn't exa expected to see that. Yeah, they, um, oh, something else to buy. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, on the, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, it's the... I, I still think with the, the non-criticality of the cable, you'll be able to bend it over and uh, not have any problem. Well, let's see. As yeah. far as the 40 pin, I don't have any idea. I mean, I don't know. Is it, if you went to two and a half inch pipe, would it be prohibitive? I mean, that's not very much bigger. And will it, the auger still give you a big enough hole or not? No. Uh, it's kind of like you got to. Already bigger than the auger now. And move it around and. Yeah, but, but um, we'll see. You know, we're trying to, you know, we'd like to have a repeatable um, approach you know, a set of instructions that tells how to people how to use fairly, um, uh, fairly readily available um, tools to, yeah. to deploy these things. And, and, and I know, know I'll never use a garden auger for anything else <laughs> in my life. But a post hole digger now. There, there yeah. You might. Well, yeah. If it turns out that this is not the right way to do it and we need the connector back the other way, we can change it back it's just well, that we'll have to stack it up higher on the other end so we, that's why should, we have prototypes right it, yeah it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the, that life or death a problem but um it's just one more th thing to think about uh, you know yeah. the reality we well, get down to brass tacks and you need to get a couple of these and, and figure it out for yourself because you'll you'll be able to to uh to experiment with it when you have one in your hand instead of trying to guess you know yeah yeah uh, I, I just it, it I, that had been in the back of my mind um but uh yeah i have too many things in the back of my mind they're overflowing into the front of my mind and it's uh, with everything uh, else my me too me too well you uh, know when i think about this i i think about 
Ever, anytime you put something out in the yard in this semi-tropical area that I live in, oh man, trying to keep water out, insects, <laughs> um, and then you know you, you've got the every time the humidity changes, some air goes in and then it condenses, and then pretty soon it's full of water. Hey, you know, I've heard of guys that have t external towers in their backyard that feed them with pipes and they get condensation in the pipes underground. Yes, yes. So they have to actually run airflow through the pipe to keep the condensation from forming. Chipmunks. Chipmunks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you'll have raccoons come along and chew the cake. Too. I mean, hmm. there was a guy out in, out in Queen Creek where I used to live. There was a guy that had a gopher chew through the underground power feed to his house and short it out. Wow. <laughs> Boy, um, he got his teeth clean. He, did, he didn't have a gopher after that, but he didn't have any power either. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the, it, but seriously, I, I think a lot of people will have problems with you start putting something that's sensitive electronics outside and it's really a whole science just of itself to keep that from getting damaged by the yeah so that's the why elements you put, you put desiccant in it and you seal it and you bury it so far down and you rtp all the, the cables and you use underground variable cable and all that Otherwise, and then, and then you still have to change the desiccant every six months. Well, yeah. no, you do what you do what the phone company does. You blow nitrogen. You, yeah. Well, uh, that's one way, but also you can embed the whole thing in dielectric of uh, uh, grease. Yeah. So that provide that prevents any ingress of of anything, and it it has a nasty taste. So the <laughs> you know animals and insects don't. I bother it so much so well, you i mean the that's... guys that take that build pcs and they fill the whole case up with oil and they use that for cooling <laughs> well i i've never heard of that yeah i mean yeah. that but not the whole case there, there would be a there'd be a a, a a heat pipe connected to oh no it was no heat pipe the they, the whole th they immerse the whole board at least the motherboard oh. I don't know how, how they what kind of it's you can't use a standard case you have yeah, to have a romantic case. That doesn't that make the mouse and the keyboard hard to use? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get slippery, you know. I don't know. Well, I I have been to IEEE conventions where they were showing a demo of of something like that, where they had a television set inside of a fish tank filled with some kind of dielectric liquid, and the, it was working fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your yeah. basic, your basic early cray computer you know fill it with like at the at the uh I used, to, I used to uh jeremy and i used to have fights over this but i found a uh the guy who took an apple computer and he made a beer server out of it <laughs> <laughs> he put a mini keg inside and it's a little te cooler to keep the beer cool and he put a spigot on the front and <laughs> And so at one of the talks I gave when I knew what Jeremy was going to be there, I, I put the slide up and I said, best use of an Apple computer. And I had a picture of it. Yeah. So, so was that Apple computer his server? Yeah, the pure <laughs> server. The <laughs> server. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think in his presentation that he said, best use of a Windows computer. And he had a laptop stuck in a window holding it open. You know, so it's a Windows computer. <laughs> I've got to run. We'll see you yes, next. it's getting time. It's getting late. So yeah. enjoyed it. Thanks for the help on reviewing the specs. All right, um, Bill, thanks yep. for putting the documentation out. I missed that instrument um, table, but I, you really covered a lot of the questions I had. Once you went through it tonight, I, I see what I forgot to do. Yeah. yeah, and Dave, I'll get you an updated uh, KV0S. I'll get yes. you some updated documents without the garbage in, inside the PDF. And I will link those uh, documents on your page. And I should uh, probably change the GitHub over to the Pi one instead of the Notes one. Uh, you mean instead of the... Uh, on the Tangerine SDR website, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pointing to the Tangerine Notes, and it should probably be the Tangerine Pi. Yeah, because I haven't updated the other one for probably three months, ever since okay. I realized we got we need to use a Pi for this. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 73. 73. 73. Good night. 73.
73. Oh, are you still a host, Dave? I am, yes. I guess I need to turn the uh, recording off. That'd be a good idea. But, uh, Probably should have done that about five minutes ago. Yes, all those stories. <laughs> I can't. Where is the. Oh, here it is. So, Dan, I found the pataya. <laughs> 